everyone has some sort of knowledge, some sort of expertise. Uh, the hard part is to unlock it and to share it, but we all have that knowledge. And LinkedIn is that platform to share that knowledge. And it can be any type of industry, any type of niche. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. I'm Alessandro Bogliari, CEO of the company, and today with me we have Daniel Markovitz, that is the creator and community at LinkedIn. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Alessandro. Ciao. Good to have you, and thanks for the invite. Absolutely. First of all, how is uh, how is your week so far? Uh, what happened in the in the past in the past days? Uh, uh, how how is it uh, this this period of the year with you? Uh, all good. I'm here in London, so it's getting cold, um, but uh, all good as usual following the World Cup. I'm from Ecuador, uh, so actually not the best week for us as we lost yesterday. It was a bit depressing, to be fair, but uh, nothing we can do. That's how football is. Uh, but I mean, you're, you're talking with an Italian, right? That is not even in the World yes. Cup this year. So, so <laughs> I, guess, we can. Uh, <laughs> I guess I did better than you, so can't complain. <laughs> Amazing. And so, first of all, who, who is Daniel? How, how, what is your background? How, uh, what is up now that you're doing at LinkedIn? Can you, can you tell me a bit more of your, like, you know, just a few minutes of your background and story? Sure. I'll, I'll try to give you a quick uh, overview. But uh, I'm Danny, as people call me, originally from Ecuador, as mentioned, but uh, been uh, living in a couple of countries. So definitely I'm considering a citizen of the world. Uh, I lived in Israel for a long time, and now I'm currently in London working for LinkedIn. Uh, but in the past, I also worked a long time at a media, media company called Minute Media that I would love to share more uh, during our conversation. And I think media, sports, content has always been a, a passion of mine. So I've been lucky to, to have worked uh, at that intersection of, of those industries and currently very excited to be part of LinkedIn, uh, of a new newer team supporting creators and community. Uh, LinkedIn is definitely making a push uh, in the space. And I was one of the first people in the team building the foundations in the uk and working with amazing creators um across the world yeah amazing i mean we, you know for anyone that is either listening for the first time on the episode or uh maybe just check a few of them on this on the podcast usually we try to understand what is happening in the in the, in the uh -huh. industry right on different point of view uh we had reporters uh, uh we had people building platforms for the creator economy. We had other big, like, you know, maybe e-commerce websites that are talking about what is happening in the creator economy, influencers, and so on. And I'm really happy, actually, to have someone from LinkedIn today because uh, I, I know that today we're going to talk about you as a professional, and we're also going to dip in a bit, you know, like what LinkedIn is doing, but we're going to talk about them. But I'm really happy to talk with you because we all can see what LinkedIn has done in the past, I would say, a couple of years, and especially in the last year uh, for content creators, uh, giving the opportunity to really like everyone creating content and getting to uh, a bigger reach of people and the right people, right? Because something needs to get a lot of views maybe uh, uh, on TikTok and, and I, I love TikTok, right? But it's a different audience sometimes. And maybe a million of views there um, can be the equivalent of a good hundred views on LinkedIn because it's the right people, professional, right? You are targeting. So um, how do you think that LinkedIn is changing the, the creator economy in the in the, in the past year? Uh, yeah, great question. And, and yeah, big fan of the podcast, by the way. I, I've listened to a few episodes. I actually listened to the one you had with Evan, the, the CEO of, of Famous Birthdays, mm -hmm. who is actually, um, yes. by the way, a creator we work with uh, at LinkedIn as well. So definitely a small world. Oh, nice. But going, going to your question about uh, LinkedIn specifically. Yes. Um, and yeah, I think LinkedIn is a very unique platform, uh, specifically when it comes to the creator economy. Um, mostly because, as you mentioned, the, one of the key benefits of LinkedIn is the, 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 the people that are part of the platform and, and the, the reach, the, the, the people you can reach when creating content, as opposed to maybe other platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, that I'm also a big fan of. It's more about reach. It's more about um, massive numbers, uh, about entertainment. Uh, LinkedIn can also be about entertainment, but it's more about professional conversations, about um, sharing your knowledge. Uh, so it's not, we try to push our creators to share their knowledge and expertise and not just share content for the sake of sharing content. So it's much more intentional, much more strategically. And I also believe you reach a very specific type of people, what we call the decision makers, more of a professional audience, mm -hmm. the people they actually 
um, are open to to create economic opportunities. So I think that's a key differentiator from us here on LinkedIn and something we've we're seeing firsthand that 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 really moves the needle. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, even when I post something, I can see that you have both the brand awareness, but you can also drive traffic with to something that you care, right? Could could be this podcast, could be uh, a landing page to download the report, or even just like to make connections. Uh, to be honest, like what I really like on LinkedIn is that uh, even if uh, someone else that is in your network is liking or commenting on some others, you get to the different tiers of networking, and you find out of either content that you didn't know that existed, or you find out about people that you didn't know. So it's not just like a one-on-one, but uh, it is this sort of like, you know, network effect, right? And, and LinkedIn is, is doing a great job in that. And uh, um, and also like something that I like it is that everyone can become a, a content creator, right? On, on LinkedIn, you are facilitating that a lot. You are um, giving more tools. Uh, you are pushing like some other things out there. So why do you think nowadays it's also a bit easier for people on LinkedIn? Like the barrier is lower nowadays, it's easier to do. Uh, so can you can you tell me a bit more like what what your guys are building there and and also the why the reason behind of that? So I do th- I agree with you that uh, it's easier in a sense to become a creator in LinkedIn uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think there's more flexibility when it comes to formats, and actually we've been building a lot mm-hmm. you know, on the product side of things. As I mentioned, LinkedIn has been really pushing a lot on the creator side of things. So in TikTok, for example. If you want to create content, you have to create video, which uh, for some people is easy and natural, but for others like me, it's a really challenging format and it's really hard, harder to crack, if you know what I mean. In LinkedIn, there's a more formats, more flexibility. You can do, of course, text-based posts. You can also do video. You can do polls. You can do LinkedIn Lives. You can do audio events. You can do newsletters. So there's really a space for everyone in, in the sense of format. So that's one side of things. Two, which I think it's yeah. really, really key here and something we, me and my team have been pushing for is trying to unlock um, a- anyone's expertise. We believe, and I'm a, I'm a believer that everyone has some sort of knowledge, some sort of expertise. Uh, the hard part is to unlock it and to share it, but we all have that knowledge. And LinkedIn is that platform to share that knowledge. And it can be any type of industry, any type of niche. Not only that, I think the nicher your expertise, the better, the more opportunities for you to go deeper and build a, a strong community. So I think, um, again, it's, it's a matter of formats, but also a matter that anyone has a, everybody has a place in LinkedIn, as opposed to maybe other platforms that are more, more specific to a specific type of people. So those two really come to mind here. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree. Like I saw many also like uh, groups, right, uh, that you can join that are really specific to certain industries. Uh, and the knowledge, like the, the level of knowledge that they have is really like narrowed down to the, you know, some super details. And you have people that are either working on the same things or I, I saw people like doing polls, like asking specific questions and they find, they found their people, right? Because, because of that. So uh, I, 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 I can totally see that. Is there anything else uh, that uh, you would like to share on LinkedIn or anything else that you are I don't know, working on anything that you can share with us that is either exciting or all that. Hey, quick break. This podcast is hosted by the Influencer Marketing Factory. We are an influencer marketing agency that helps brands and companies engage with Gen Z and millennials on social media. We take care of influencer identification, storytelling, creativity, negotiation, contracting, campaign management, error analysis, in-depth reporting, content boosting, and much, much more. Are you interested in learning more? You can find us at theinfluencermarketingfactory.com or you can Google The Influencer Marketing Factory. What I'm really excited about LinkedIn and having seen that firsthand with uh, some of the creators I work with is the opportunities that can uh, arise from sharing content. So after working there for a year, I really believe that content uh, is a magnet uh, for many things. Uh, and, and I always encourage people to open up and to share their knowledge, their experience. And I think uh, in LinkedIn specifically, um, people are there to connect, to collaborate, to create opportunities. So I lo- a lot of people are just creating content without being full-time creators. They're just trying mm-hmm. to add value to their community. And in return, people get uh, speaking opportunities. People get investment opportunities. You can find a job. You can hire someone. And I think content is becoming the new CV as opposed to showing where did you work, where did you go to school. Your content can show other people what you think, what you've done. So it's really the best way to showcase what are you doing, what do you think, and it really opens a lot of doors. So that I'm really excited about. And lastly, that LinkedIn is really, again, pushing on the space. With a small example, just a few months ago, 
we created something called creator mode, which is still mm -hmm. something new for, for, for most people, which allows people to basically uh, enable or, or showcase signal the world that you're a creator and um, you get access to different tools. Your content uh, is, you, you have more uh, avail uh, options to showcase your content differently. And most importantly, um, the call to action in your profile is people to follow you as opposed to connect with you, which is mm -hmm. a subtle difference with, with big impact. So I'm just excited to, on, on what, what lies ahead for us as I think we're just beginning uh, here at LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, I've been using that one since like the day that I saw that was live. I went on the settings, I was like creator mode on and I start like, Super easy. anytime that I see a new link, a new feature, I, sometimes I go to the, you know, the pencil icon, I go there, I check if there is anything new. So now I have all the different call to action, I have to follow because I'm, I'm also invest, starting investing more on LinkedIn. Like I, I post every single day, I'm trying different formats, right, uh, to, to really, um, you know, try to drive more traffic to, to the page and I can see that it's working well. So I... Uh, well done on that. And also I, I like when you say about the, Thank you. Uh, the networking, because I do agree, you never know who is the person that's going to potentially change your career or your life. And, and I, so yeah, like I also pieces of advice for everyone that is listening. Don't be shy, go out there and, and share your knowledge, maybe because of a like of a comic or someone, right? What I always tell people, and I didn't come up with this analogy, but I really liked it is that the content in general, but specifically in LinkedIn is like a lottery ticket. Every post you create is like a lottery ticket that yeah. for free that you have the option yeah. to win. One content can lead you to a new job, to a new founder, to a new opportunity. So you never know what's going to happen and, and there's no downside. So I really like that analogy and I use it a lot. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Oh, you're totally right. I think that it's, uh, you know, one of them can makes, makes you exactly. know, a big, a big difference, right? This is LinkedIn, right? But uh, overall, you as said uh, at the beginning of the, of the episode, you also have a lot of experience in media. You work in... Uh, uh, Minute Media for how many years was it? Eight, seven, eight, nine? How yeah, um, it was my first job out of college um, in Israel, uh, and I was there for uh, more than eight years. So uh, I was lucky enough to join the company early, and and when the company was still a startup, now mm -hmm. it's a pretty big company that owns some very cool brands like uh, Ninety Min, the Players Tribune and some other great brands uh, internationally. Oh, wow. But I was lucky that I was able to do a bit of everything, wear different hats and really uh, lead amazing projects. So yeah, it was a great experience for me. Nice, it's it's a great way for you to learn like a lot of things because when you, I, as you said, when you jump in and when it's smaller, you do many things, different hats, like you know, different roles. You can see a little bit of everything, but then when it grows, like you have the opportunity to see it like growing and, uh, and, and learning more and, and, and it helps both of them, right? When it's small, when it's uh, medium or when it's a bit, you know, bigger, so you can see different exactly. uh, infrastructure. So in, this, in those like eight years and even now, how did you see, um, first of all, content changing and also how brands are adapting? Because what I say all the time on the podcast is that we went from big production, 40 people in a studio to record a video that costs you millions. And now we have content creators from their apartment uh, uh posting something on linkedin that maybe gets one million of views like that uh, for free so yeah. how how brands are adapting to this i've learned a lot during this experience and i i, can, I, love, I would love to share how media is changing but first it's important to mention how media was a decade ago which was part of the the media mm -hmm. industry i was part of which was really pushing for scale you know for numbers um, it was, I think, a wrong assumption that the bigger you are in terms of what we call traffic visitors, the more su successful you are, which I don't think it's the case. So, and, and we were guilty in that sense as well, riding the waves of Facebook, of social traffic, um, similar to what happened with BuzzFeed and other great companies that um, were looking for scale and creating hundreds of pieces of content a day, expanding to every country, every market, and just trying to to be number one in Conscore because that will lead you to more advertising. And in a way it was true, but nowadays these companies are suffering um, because most of their traffic sources were not direct, were not owned. You were depending always on Google, on Facebook, on different algorithms, and you were at the mercy of these algorithms, which happened also to some of our brands. Um, so I think that's really changing. I think nowadays, um, I, I'm, I'm very happy to see that many new companies are much more lean, are much more sustainable, um, are much more dependent and focused on who the writer is, on who the journalist is, 
on who the face is, you know. People, readers, um, identify much more with a face than with a logo. So mm -hmm. and that's why nowadays uh, I'm a huge fan, and, and I think you agree with me, Alessandro, of, of podcasts, but also of, of newsletters that are coming back to life because yeah. you really make a connection with a writer. You know what they're talking about. You know what's expected. And the quality is just much higher. And you don't need fancy productions. You don't need tons of editorial uh, teams. Uh, you just want good content. And, and it's less about scale and more about um, growing sustainable, monetizing sustainably, uh, creating community, and just um, connecting with your audience, which I think uh, was not the case a decade ago. I can see that. And I, I agree. Like... Uh people are following other people, right? They are not following necessarily companies. Maybe maybe they do, but yes. the experience, the peer-to-peer -peer connection that we can have, right, is different. So absolutely. And uh, so on that, since, uh, you know, as you said, like brands are changing, there's new type of content. People are following sometimes more the reporters, less like journalists, more, more even more than the media. If you follow the newsletter, because you trust the person, right? So is there any uh, either like do's and don'ts that uh, in your years of experience, maybe, um, you saw happening, or is there anything, I, any any like little pieces of advice to to recommend to others that want to maybe share content online? Yeah, uh, what works, what doesn't? I think first, uh, what works, uh, and if I would have started a media company now, it's um, go niche. You know, you don't need to be a, a, if you try mm -hmm. to be everything for everyone, you will end up being a nothing. Um, so be stand up for something, yeah. choose a niche, and then go deep on that niche. Uh, you don't need to, to have 50 million uh, readers. You can have a sustainable business with a much uh, smaller audience, but that it's really owned by you, that you have a direct relationship, that uh, that they know who you are. Many people back in the day just uh, arrived to websites because of, of, of algorithms. So that's, that's not the right recipe nowadays. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, it's focus on quality of content and not on quantity. Um, again, uh, much more important to do one piece a week that it's amazing than you know 10 a day that it's that are not really good so again quality always beats quantity and yeah own your channels uh, invest on owning your channels even if, if it takes time don't take shortcuts uh, build your brand uh, mm -hmm. own your email subscriptions uh, reach people where they are via podcast uh, it's important to have also social presence but at the end of the day you want to own that funnel um, and yeah i think what we're seeing with creators nowadays is the same case um, Creators are so successful because they own the relationship. The successful creators are not at the mercy of their platform. They can, if, if one platform, when they close it, they can take their audience to other platforms and, 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 and their audience have that relationship and trust. So I think that's the key with media and, and with the attention economy as a whole. Yeah, exactly. The, the attention economy is, is a big thing, right? Like you, you want to get that. And uh, a, a lot of people are also saying that apart from content creators, a lot of brands and I'm talking about, uh, I mean, mostly B2C, of course. Uh, I'm talking about mostly not just physical products, but primarily are becoming, or at least they have to become a media company, right? Because again, you want to see a, a face, you want to have a storytelling, you want to have a, more than just a brand image, you want to have a, a human being behind that. Again, for customer acquisition, to fight for attention. Do, do you agree with that? Do you think it is the next future. I 100% agree with the cliche that every company is or will at some point be a media company. I'm not saying completely, mm -hmm. but today where, where the internet, where content is uh, abundant, the scarce thing now is attention. So everything is about attention and distribution. And the old methods of reaching people and of acquiring customers, as you said, uh, ads, Google, uh, Social media, uh, they're a bit uh, suffocated. They're a bit, um, they changed a lot. It's much more expensive. So you really want to own, again, your attention and, and reach people where they are. So we're seeing big software companies acquiring media companies like HubSpot did, like Stripe did, mm -hmm. like Angel did with, um, with I think, um, Indie Hackers or Product Hunt. I don't remember. But um, really building that content muscle. And I think also important to mention, back in the day, most companies had a blog and, and they believed that was already uh, having a media strategy. Uh, having a blog uh, by itself, it doesn't cut it anymore. You need a proper media strategy. You need resources. You need planning. Uh, you need investments. So, so yeah, I think uh, in the long term, everybody will be competing for those eyeballs and attention. And the, the companies 
that will succeed will be the ones that uh, will crack uh, those 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 channels. Uh, the product doesn't cut it anymore. You really need distribution nowadays. So I think it's definitely true what you said. No, totally. Uh, like I, I think also that people like the behind the scene of a brand, right? They want to see that side that is a bit more vulnerable, right? Like we saw that with, uh, I mean, we all know the big example of like, you know, Duolingo with, uh, with the mascot and we also like, you know, with, with other brands. But the more I go, uh, think about it like, you know, now the sensation of like Liquid Death, for example, or some other brands like that. They invested like, it's a media, like to me, that is a media company even before a brand, right? In that specific case, it's all about marketing. It's about 100%. They monetize water, but they're right. A media Think about it. even back in the days, uh, what was that? The example of the million dollar, uh, the shaving company, the million dollar, what was the name of that one? I'm I one um, dollar club, uh, do uh, yeah, dollar, yeah, oh, that one was it, right? That was what 10 years ago, something like that. But if you think about it, like to me, that was right a long time ago when I was like, you know, this, this sort of media sensation on YouTube type of thing, they created a lot of content. And then the brand, like they, they used to say like, this is not the best product, but it's cheap. You can have it at your place. You know, they, they really went there and be like, we are different for this. And, and I, I think that they were one of the first doing like something on really on the media, a lot of D DTC products, uh, they invested a lot of in their media presence because they, they know that their product might not be either the best or they maybe are in a, sometimes in a red ocean, right? So they, they, they are competing, but what if they can bring on the media, right? So um, is there any other thing that you're seeing that is happening in that about the, trying to get fight for attention and media branding? I love what you said about behind the scenes because that's someone I also always encourage uh, that people I work with at LinkedIn to, to do. People want to connect. People want to find relatable things with, with a brand, with the other mm -hmm. side, to put a face into things. So I love when brands open up, when they show mistakes, failures, uh, when they really show their true face that not everything is amazing. And another example that I, that I think it's why platforms like TikTok, even Netflix has a problem competing with, with TikTok. Production is not, is not a, a, an indication of content or a success. That's, that's how you see users with a phone in their house it's about a format. It's about a story. It's about the, the storytelling and less about the production and the money you put behind. Uh, really, users don't care as much as that. Maybe for a movie, for that, that's a different story, but it's more about showing behind the scenes and, and showing who you are. And that's, I think, really changing. I think a few brands are really understanding that. And, and I think sports, we're going to speak about that as well. But that's why mini series or documentaries like the football ones, where they show what's happening in the locker room, in the bus. That's what really fans want to see. They want to see what happens behind doors. What does Messi do with his family? What does Ronaldo do in training? You want to see the day-to-day, -day, you know? And that's why the whole media industry is changing. Yeah, yeah. You know what? To me, like, when you when you said about, like, players being followed with the camera and talking about their family, this, this to me, I don't know if you agree, but to me, it seems like that we had the sort of... Um, we're going niche with the Kim Kardashian model, right? So... We had the, the Kardashians, right, uh, every single day following them and then became almost meta, right? Because it was just the show about the show, right? Like, so that was, that was a, a right. me really meta. But I think that we are getting now the model, uh, the what we're saying now. So we are getting um, all these people, like what is the behind the scene? Or even if it is like still a show, right? Because when you watch this type of thing, it's never really that authentic. It's still scripted. Sometimes it's a bit staged, you know? But I think that we're getting like there, right? So we're looking at these people like, okay, after the game, what happens there, you know? And so these uh, to bring to one of one of your passion, I know that you're really passionate about sports. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to ask you about that because nowadays, uh, uh, yeah, people follow the games, but as as you were mentioning before, people follow, follow also like people, right? Other people, the players and the coach and everything. Yeah. How is it changing the sports and media? Sports and media is changing in, in many, many ways. One that I think uh, an obvious one is that create um, athletes, but also teams mm -hmm. are be and leaks are becoming uh, publishers in their own way. Um, so they're becoming content franchises, publishers. Um, you can see everything that the NBA is doing, that Manchester City is doing, um, not only showing the game, but showing behind the scenes, creating content for a, a specific platform. So every team league and player uh, understands the power of reaching their audience and, and becoming a media company. So that's mm -hmm. one. And also athletes, you can see why the NBA has been so successful compared to the NFL or the MLB is because of the um, 
amazing work that teams and players have been doing on, on social media. Um, they have really gone above and beyond with different formats, with different ideas. I love, for example, the NBA. When I don't know if you're a fan, but when, when they do, they put microphones in the players during the games. So mm -hmm. you can hear the players talking, you know. Uh, that's what the fans want to see. They want to see the real shit, what's happening yeah. for real. Uh, so that's just one example of how uh, sports and media are converging. Um, second, as you said, uh, how people, and especially the younger generations, um, consume content, but also how they approach things. So especially with, with the people that are not the real fans, uh, which a lot of the younger people uh, I've been hearing, they don't have time or patience to watch a 90 min minutes game. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're more, you know, they're all over the place. They want, they're watching things in different screens. So the other day I was watching a Mexican creator. Um, instead of watching the game in the stadium, he was just showing himself the whole game. And that's a famous format. And he had like 2 million people uh, in the stream. And the whole people following him are not watching the game. They're just watching him. So people care, these people wow. care le less about what happened in the game and more what this creator was doing, celebrating, chanting, cursing. Um, so that's a, it's a crazy thing for me. But I think that's a big shift on what's happening in sports, but also in media as a whole. You said 2 million people like at the same time? like Yeah, concurrent. Wow, that's... Incredible. Um, I mean, it's, it's so not that easy I think, <laughs> to get 2 million people. No, no, like I'm talking about <laughs> big creators, but wow. it's just an example of how things are changing. And I think people, again, not the biggest fans, really care about what happens, less what happens in the pitch and more what happens before the game, after the game. Um, and then you're also seeing a lot of partnership developing in the space. For example, Snapchat and UFC did a partnership. The yeah. NFL and Dude Perfect, which is a famous YouTube channel, did a cool partnership. And ultimately, one that is really relevant for now, that I thought was genius, is the FIFA partner with YouTube um, to give the rights to a few YouTubers to broadcast the games. And I think that's going to be a, a big shift in the future, where creators are going to have rights and um, FIFA or the leagues will find ways to monetize that attention, similar to what um, the video game industry did that instead of nowadays as you probably know alessandro you can buy games for free not buy you can yeah. get games for free mm -hmm. uh, and then video games understood that the power was on the what happens after in video games you can buy different things yeah but the games are free and that i think is going to be massive and i think sports it's a prediction of mine might head that way uh, I, I, I mean, I can see that uh, if there are enough purchases for games, as you just said, why not doing live? Sure. Like, to, to be honest, like knowing myself that I, I really watch sports, but I always want like, well, anything, like especially Euro Cup and the World Cup, um, like I would potentially maybe do not buy like, you know, the access to for the game, like to watch it, but uh, maybe I would do something inside or I would donate to our, our team, but like I would do something else if I am engaged in that moment, right? Even, you know, like uh, maybe I could, I, could pay, I could pay only for my, for my team, but for the others, I would maybe only watch it like highlights or I would get, you know, so I, I get it. And I think it's, it's a really interesting idea. Like how can you make gamification or get into something that is different, like in-app purchases in the, in, the, in the game, like not just e-gaming, but traditional games, right? There is, there is opportunities, a big market. I, I agree with you. One last example of sports. I think two months ago in the UK, there was a famous football game for charity between famous YouTubers like Mr. Beast and, and other famous, famous people and yeah. another creative creators called Sidemen. And it was just a football game for charity. They raised $1 million, which is amazing. But besides that, I think 30,000 people attended the game in physical presence for an amateur game. Mm -hmm. And I think two to three million concurrent peak viewers were watching the game. So that just shows you the power of creators and the power of, of the IP of creating these franchises, this intellectual property that people connect more with, with, with personalities and creators. And maybe the game was not amazing. I did think it was better than I expected, but it was not professional. Yeah, it was not a league. You, you watch, they were not playing for it. You don't watch that for the, they're not players. Like, you know, it's. Crazy. No, it's more for the, for the experience, for the creators you follow, for the banter. 
and it was just a massive success. And this is just the beginning of what's going to happen with creators and, and I mean, sports. it's the same. Uh, I don't know if that happens uh, all over the world, but in Italy, we have a lot of uh, uh, games where actors uh, or singers, uh, they play. And it's for yeah. charity. Yeah, the quality of the game, I wouldn't say there is A plus, you know. It's, you know, B minus, I would say sometimes, even C. But again, you... But that's part of the appeal, yeah. Right, it's the appeal. You want to see, okay, these people usually they sing and they act uh, how they are going to be in the field. And you follow them just because you, you, you want to see VIPs, right? Uh, you know, be there and sweating on, on a field, right? And uh, um, I, yeah, the same concept should be for content creators, right? So, and also, like, what I like before, what you said is about, um, uh, like, collaborations. Because I think in that way, you're bringing in people that maybe do not too much about sport, but are interested in the content creator exactly. or, or the brand and vice versa, right? That's what is happening in fashion. That is what is happening in the makeup industry. So why not also in the sports? Aguero is another example. He's now working with Star Plus and he he streams games. He, he streams uh, and people, just, I prefer to watch Aguero narrating a game or uh, explaining things happening as opposed to a real commentator being super serious. And it's just a convergence of, of, of these two trends that is happening in front of our eyes. And this is just the beginning. So I think media and sports is one of the industries that will be completely disrupted in the future. No, yeah, I know that sometimes people like they go and listen to certain channels, maybe because they like the commentator, because it's funny, right? And I used to do the same, like uh, also for some play, like this is for mostly for rugby and the Six Nation. I love two of the commentators that we have in Italy. They are super funny. And I, I love rugby, so I, I, I still like watch it and everything. But the comments that they do is what me engage, make me engage for all the all the time 100%. because it gives that twist to the, like it's it's funny. Like you're like even if you're we we lose all the time, okay? Italian rugby right? we lose all the time, <laughs> but they made me laugh. <laughs> so you know it's a good combination. At least you know. At least I'm laughing while losing. So and uh, do you have like uh, by any chance? Um, any statistics numbers? Because again, we, we said that before that it's something growing. But uh, is there anything that specifically you have like when it comes to sports uh, and, and media? Anything that either shocked you, surprised you when it comes to numbers? Yeah, I think one that comes to mind that I was seeing that I think I mentioned um, Snapchat and, 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 and did a partnership with UFC. But I think also it's Snapchat. I read that last year around 200 million people watch sports content in Snapchat. So I think uh, leagues and teams are being very, very smart about who to partner with and how to go where their audiences are, especially with a younger generation. So that was a, a very interesting stat. And the other one that I just shared with you again, the, the, the charity match between Sidemen and YouTube um, was a massive win, not only because they raised money, but how many people went to the stadium, how many people watched the game uh, uh, online. Um, and again, I think this is only the beginning and um, I'm very excited about this space specifically. And you can see also what's happening with Amazon uh, broadcasting uh, Premier League games. Netflix announced that they, they will go into real uh, television as well. So there's a massive shift from linear to streaming and uh, everything is converging in a way. <laughs> yeah. And 200 million said before, right? On Snap? Yeah. 200 million. That's, that's a big number. Uh, that's that's a big number. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Sometimes when I look at not like a millions, I know that like uh, compared maybe to other countries like China and India, it's small numbers. When you when you see that, especially in the in the US, uh, that is what a little bit less than three hundred fifty million in population, and uh, you yeah. know Europe combined with different like countries is still like smaller numbers compared to Asia. Two hundred million, it's it's a big number actually. Just like to on on, on a specific platform, right? Uh, it's a big number, and uh, and yeah, I think um, it's only the beginning. Is there anything else uh, that I either didn't ask you today, or anything else excited you, like uh, that uh, you are working on, or do you would like to see happening in the in the next future? Something uh, that definitely excites me, and that I've been kind of uh, going into the rabbit hole, it's everything that's happening with AI, uh, specifically around media, mm -hmm. and there has been a huge buzz in the last months of different tools. Um, coming up uh, that really do magic. I don't know if you've played with some of them, Dali, Stable, yeah. Me Journey. Uh, and I think the key here is how it's going to impact creators and um, the media world. Uh, it's hard to, 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 to predict, but I think it's going to be a massive um, player in the space. So I'm just very curious to see what's going to be the role between humans and, and AI. Is it going to be 
a collaboration. I don't think AI will ever replace creators as a whole, but they're definitely going to be, there's no way to avoid it anymore. I think it's happening. It's just a matter of how we implement and how we um, work with it and how we really make sure uh, we use it for good. But it's definitely something that um, I'm really looking close and that I think it's going to touch all the industry. But in my world, um, it's definitely going to play a big role as well. So wanted to hear your opinion as well, but it's definitely something I'm I'm very much um, uh, looking Yo, to no, see. I I can see that. I've been myself so on these for anyone that is in, interested. Actually, we do have uh, an episode with the founder of Lightrix, that is the conglomerate that has all apps like Facetune, Videolip, and others. And we went on, uh, um, you know, um, just like an analysis of what is happening in the AI. And we went through exactly these, like text uh, to image, text to video, uh, all the different, like, you know, tools that you can use. Uh, and we went like, okay, what, how content creators can use this? Because someone can say this is disrupting the industry. Some others are saying, actually, no, this is actually be a big help for content creators to reinvent themselves can facilitate things. So I also do agree that, uh, of course, like, you know, certain things in the gig economy that you had to go on, let's say on Fiverr and some other places and I had to pay someone. Now you can easily yeah. do it by yourself. But uh, it's just the history of technology. There is all the time new things and instead of being like afraid or like scared or be like reluctant about things, I think that you should just embrace them and be like, okay, how can we use them in a good way? And I'm pretty sure that we're going to be used not just for content creation and when it comes to AI, but really to make certain things that now we have to make manually, just how to make them. And we're going to just have a better mm -hmm. life on that. And we can use our brain to do other things instead of doing things that we can do with AI. So I see it as a, as a big help, apart from all the content creation, but just a help in general, so that we as human beings, we can use your, our brain for something where we, we have to think more than just input output. You know what I mean? I think people mistakenly say that um, it's gonna take many people out of jobs but that's that's just the nature of technology similar to the internet it did replace a lot of jobs but see how many jobs it opened up so i think it's gonna be the same with with with, with this new wave of technology yeah, absolutely you can see it like you know something super negative uh, that it, like you know it's gonna gonna ruin many jobs or you can see it as uh, it's just again it has it happened for like everyone from you know like when 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 uh, the iPhone came out, uh, the camera industry, right? That was like, oh, then people don't need us anymore, but they reinvented themselves somehow. Some of them, they failed. Some others, they reinvented themselves, right? In, in giving more products or they had to pivot, yeah. but they, 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 they had to work on maybe better quality, you know, new different type of models. It's just part of the evolution of uh, not just technology, but I would say- Evolution. Uh, yeah, evolution, right? It's anthropology there, right? So it's, it's part of, uh, of us. So um, I love it. Absolutely. It's something that I've been following closely. And I'm, I would say that uh, some are working well, some others not that yet. But it's, I would say we're just at the beginning. Like now, the past months, everyone is talking about it. There's going to be a sort of think learning curve. Uh, still only a few people compared to the mass population is going to start using that, I would say. Uh, even if it is not technical, uh, you know, I, I would say that it's going to take a little bit for mass adoption. So I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't I worry agree. much for, for the next, uh, next months. Um, okay. I want just to ask a, a super quick Q and A that I usually do with guests. Okay. It's going to be more about you. You can tell your answer could be one word, could be a little sentence, or you can go a bit more on that. It's going to be super, super fast. Okay. Yeah. Just, just about you. Bring it on. Okay. So, uh, if you were a superhero. What powers um, would you like to have? I think uh, I'm not a huge superhero fan, but um, being invisible, I think it's, um, I would love being invisible and there's so many use cases that you can come up with. So I'll take that one any day. I like it. Um, are you more for books or movies? Lately, I've been reading a lot, uh, but I still go for movies. I'm a huge uh, movie fan. Okay. So what's your favorite movie? I'm going to go with... Um, Catch me if you can. Just today I was uh, watching a video about the real, uh, what was the name, uh, Avanyal? That's a coincidence. Yeah, it's not a very common answer for this question, but I, I, it's a, a movie I really like. Okay, tomorrow you, you win the lottery. It's 10 million cash, just on you. So you didn't have to work for it. What do you buy? First thing. I think I will buy a top house. I think that's a good investment. Uh, really uh, a cool house, maybe in the beach. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, it's that's a city investment. 
safe one, right? <laughs> Safer investment and I wouldn't regret it as opposed to maybe cards or toys. <laughs> okay. And what is your favorite food? You're going to like my answer. Um, Italian, I can eat Italian every day. I'm going to go with a classic pizza. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no day that I cannot eat pizza. Yeah, that's a big yes for me. You're not the first one <laughs> on the pod to say pizza and I'm really, really I'm happy sure about it. <laughs> really happy to hear Thanks that. Okay. So um, last two. Would you prefer to breathe underwater or fly? Fly. No one is no uh, telling me breathe that. underwater like so far. Everyone is flying. I also am on flying. So um, I still ask. I'm curious to see if anyone is going get, to gonna get back to me with a breath underwater. But I, last one, book smart or street smart? Street smart. And also this is like majority of people are on the street smart. Maybe it's the people coming on the podcast. I don't know. But so far it's mostly street <laughs> smart and, and I love it. Um, I, I, that, I mean, I wish I was smarter. So I'll take the street there any day. <laughs> we can, we, yeah, we can use that one like uh, uh, for uh, like, yeah, I wish, but I'm going to go with the street smart. And uh, no, but I, I love it. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for joining me today. You brought a lot of knowledge. I hope you liked it uh, sharing more with the uh, audience today. Uh, where, where can people find you? I, I, I guess on, on LinkedIn? Uh, first of all, thanks, Alessandro. Really great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I think LinkedIn Absolutely. is a, an obvious one. Uh, share, connect with me, follow me. Uh, and if you need any LinkedIn related questions, I'm more than happy to help uh, with anything. Fantastic. Again, thank you so much. This was the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. Subscribe to the channel. We're going to have other amazing guests like Danny today. And I'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.